is electric. Hi everyone, welcome back to the EV Puzzle for another energy related video and today it's the 8th of May, it's nice and sunny outside, there's no heating on in the house, it's the perfect time to look back at our first winter period with an air to air heating system. How effective has it been? How much has it cost? How much energy did we use? All of those great things. So even for yourself, I think this is the perfect time of year to reflect on your heating system. How have you got on? What have you spent? And what are you going to do in the future? What heating system are you going to go for in the future? Are you going to go electric? Hopefully I can convince you with some of the data we've got here, because I think this heating system is one of the best things we've actually done so far. Better than installing solar, it's a, it's a tough one. Better than a battery, yep. Better than a Mixergy hot water tank, yes. This heating system has been one of the best things we've installed. And the reason for that is because it feels better, it's more controllable and it's more economical. We're not afraid to use it at all. We're not trying to conserve energy. We're happy to use as much as we want. So we've got freedom to heat the house. And that really is a good feeling. Freedom because we're not worried about our heating bills. So yeah, this heating system is fantastic. And on top of the ability to heat, it's an air conditioning system too. So which is it that we're getting for free? Susan wanted this system for the air conditioning in the summer. So I'm effectively getting the heating ability in the winter for free. But I wanted this system for the heating. So perhaps Susan's getting the air conditioning in the summer for free. I'm not sure which it is. I'm not sure how to quantify the cost of that. You'll have to bear that in mind at the end when I go through the cost justification, how much we spent, how much we saved, and how many years it takes to pay back. Because it doesn't include that free element of the fact it does both things. So before we talk about the numbers and the costs, what have we got here? We've got a four bedroom house. It's a nice spacious four bedroom house um, with a separate dining room, utility room, whatever you call it. We actually just use it as a laundry room. Uh, we don't actually heat that room at all. Um, we use it to dehumidify and put laundry in in the winter, but we don't have any heating in there at all. The four bedrooms we've actually converted into three. We've knocked a wall down and made one master giant suite out of it. Um, the bathrooms, we've got an ensuite, a bathroom, and a downstairs cloakroom. So there's three of those. And a large kitchen, the room that I'm in right now. It's a nice sunny room. There's lots of glass, lots of solar gain. So we don't need a lot of heating in this room. The heating system that we've got in the house is an oil boiler system. There's no gas in the village and we have a log burner as well. All installed um, when the house was built 15 years ago and uh, nothing to do with my design at all. Our typical heating use um, before we had the electric systems was about five to 600 litres of oil a year. At the current price, that's 60 pence a litre. It's almost down to 2019 levels. It's coming down quite a lot. So oil is reducing in price. But 60 pence a litre, uh, 500 litres a year, let's say, on the economical side. I'll try to always be uh, on the economical side. Apart from the electric stuff, I'll try and overestimate on that to make sure I'm not giving an overly positive picture. So yeah, oil, 300 pounds. The log burner, we typically get through about four cubic meters and that costs 250 pounds a year for that. So in total, 550 pounds is our heating cost for this house on a normal year before we went electric. But our heating use for that, we didn't use to heat the spare room, we didn't use to heat all of the bedrooms, and we used to turn the boiler off overnight, those sort of things. So our usage profile hasn't changed that much. We use the new air-to-air -air system in a very similar way to we used to use the oil boiler. So we're quite economical, quite sparing with energy. And I've got, I've got to say, we're less sparing now that we've got this electric system. It's much freer to use the energy. I think I had it turned down more when we were using just the oil boiler. What have we replaced that with? It's a Toshiba air conditioning system. So a split system with, a f with an eight kilowatt inverter heat pump outside. I think we could have got away with a six kilowatt one, but we've got an eight kilowatt inverter and three indoor units in the lounge, the hallway, and our master bedroom. And those are three and a half kilowatt indoor units. And yet the bedroom one, that's just a two and a half kilowatt unit. So I think the way installers work is you add the three indoor units up, that's a seven, nine and a half. They would normally install a 10 kilowatt inverter. So I downsized it to eight. I think we could have got away with a six. They all do the job. The only difference is they will take longer to heat up to the right temperature. And that's what we notice with our eight kilowatt inverter that we've got. It's really powerful. It's really quick to heat up. So the house can be cold. You could have been out all day. You come home, you can turn it on and very, very quickly your house gets warm. So it's a, it's a very quick reactive system. 
totally unlike the air source heat pump wet radiator systems where you turn them on leave them on because they're very slow to react the low water temperatures that go through the radiators now i know some people will say well that's how heating systems are most economical to use you turn them on and leave them on and uh, run them like that and that's most economical well it might be most efficient for a heat pump in that you know i know it's the same if you turn the heating system on and off you get a higher spike to start with but leaving it on all day is more expensive than turning it on and off. So the ability to do that and having it quick to react is a very good feature of an air-to-air -air heating system. So the rooms that we're not heating, uh, we've got one spare bedroom and Charlotte's bedroom, they're not on the air-to-air -air system. They use an independent electric radiator, a portable electric radiator. Charlotte actually liked that. She liked having a heating system in her room that she could have on separately to the heating. So if we didn't need the heating on or didn't need it very high, she could still have her room nice and warm. She could have whatever heat she needed in that room independently. So it worked quite well. And this is one of the things you know, that bugs me about fitted kitchens and central heating systems. It's just like the thing to have. And yet having a distributed system, having a system of separates can be better. Just like hi-fi systems, separates can be better than all built in as a single system. So I, I quite like having a multitude of heating devices to heat rooms independently. I, I find that quite nice. Some people might not like that. Some people might just want to turn it on, leave it on, and everywhere's the same temperature. Um, yeah, um, some people don't look at their electricity bills, do they, I suppose, whereas, whereas I do. So yeah, it works well for me having these separate systems. Our kitchen, for example, was a good one. We could have gone with an air conditioning system in here and it would have replaced this radiator behind me with uh, an air conditioning unit. We didn't have room on a wall to actually put one. Um, we could have had one up here on the wall, but that's an inside wall, so getting the pipework outside and getting it back to the inverter would have meant we'd go over the 40 meter of pipework limitation. So yeah, there are some restrictions with doing all these sort of things and this room was a compromise. It's a compromise because on days like today and most times it's a nice warm room, especially if we're cooking, it doesn't get cold in here. But if we're not cooking and we say we're having breakfast in winter and there's no sunshine, then it can be a really, really cold room with the amount of glass that's here. So we do need a heater, but it's not very often. So does it justify having a, its own part of a central heating system? And we've decided the answer is no. So we've gone for just a separate electric heater that's actually under the table. Most of the time, let's say 90, 95% of the time, we don't need any heat in here at all. On those occasions that we do, we just turn the heater on and it's that easy. The bathrooms, we've got three of them. The bathroom, ensuite and cloakroom, they've all been disconnected. They've all got towel rails. They've been disconnected from the heating system and they've got electric immersions in them now instead. On a smart plug so I can measure how much electricity each of them is using. But it's just a small immersion. They're 300 watt immersion heaters in each of the radiators. Got to admit, the cloakroom, Probably it's oversized. I need a slightly bigger radiator or a slightly lower immersion heater in there. But the two bathrooms, they're the other way around. They're quite big radiators and the immersion's probably just a little bit small for them. So the 300 watts, maybe 320, 350 would have been perfect for those. For me, when I'm sizing a room, I'm not trying to size it and oversize it like a heating system installer might. I tend to size it for the absolute minimum because I want the smallest kilowatt load. I want the smallest power load for running the heating so that it matches our solar panels and battery capacity, battery power ability. So I want to keep all of our power in the house below, I don't know, three and a half kilowatts, even when we're turning the heating on to start with. And that way it all comes from the battery and all comes from solar. If I had to put larger immersions in, larger heating system, it would bump all those numbers up and it means we're more likely to go over our power ability, more likely to use peak rate energy. So that's why I try to keep it down as low as possible. But you've still got to provide enough heat. So it's that compromise, keeping the power low, but keeping the heat hot enough so that you actually provide the heating that you want. I've got it almost perfect. Those bathroom radiators just probably wanted a tweak, but how do you do that? You either install a new radiator um, or you install a different immersion. Whether I'll bother doing that in the future, I'm not quite sure. So with £550 to beat for our heating cost for a year, uh, let's have a look. So October through April, so I'm gonna really go for it, seven months of the year and call that our heating period for winter. Um, October and April, you know, the heating's not used that much depending on how cold it is. I think the last time we lit a log fire was the 6th of April, for example, but I'll include those months anyway. 
So seven months, October to April, that's 212 days, we used 1,315 kilowatt hours. That doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Not a lot at all. Now I do have the breakdown for those, but also we need to consider that some of the time that heating system has been used with solar energy, but it's very hard to break down. Was that solar energy used for heating or was it used for cooking? Or was it used for the lights, the television? It's very hard to know exactly where the solar energy went. So the way I'm gonna do it is look at how much energy we imported from the grid, look at how much energy we used for heating. If heating was more than what we import from the grid, then I'll use all of the imports of the grid and call it all heating. And then we'll say that the, everything else was used from solar energy. But if the heating cost is lower than the amount we import from the grid, I'll just use the amount that I know we used for heating. Because definitely in October and April, we've got more of the heating's been used from solar power. So it's nice to have free heating. And it definitely feels it on a sunny day like today, if it was cold in the house, I could have the heating on and I would not be paying for it at all. It's all coming from solar energy. And that's exactly the same for when we get to the summer, when it's really hot, we'll have the air conditioning on and that'll all come from solar power. We won't be paying for any air conditioning at all. So the breakdown then on a month by month, it's best to put it into a spreadsheet. I don't think just reading out numbers will work very well. So if we put it in the spreadsheet and put it on the screen now, you can start to see the monthly breakdown of how much energy we import from the grid, how much we used for the eddy to heat a hot water, how much we used for the Zappi to charge our electric cars. That left how much we used for heating and the house. Then I know how many kilowatt hours I used for the heating because we've got individual smart monitors for each of those. And therefore I know how much we used in the house. I know also from Octopus Energy what our average price per kilowatt hour was per month. So if I use that, multiply the two out, the price and the number of kilowatt hours we used, we get how much did it cost us for heating each month. Add them all up and that's £86.63. £86.63 for 1,315 kilowatt hours. That really is quite cheap, isn't it? So we've reduced our bills by 55% from the £500 down to £236. I did include £24 for oil usage because I did do a few days of testing of the oil boiler. So I'm not going to cheat. I'm going to add that all in. So that's 236 pounds. That's only 214 pounds saving over what we used last time. Yes, it's a 55%. So the more heating you use, the bigger the saving you could make with this sort of system. But for us, 55% is 214 pounds. The heating system cost 5,250 pounds. So yeah, 46 year payback. That probably isn't the best financial decision that we've made, but as I said, it's the best decision we've made for something we've installed for the house for the future. It's saving energy. It means we've got better heating. It feels nicer. We've got air conditioning as well. It truly is fantastic. And we're happy to have spent the money. So even though it doesn't cost justify in that 46 year payback on its own, it sort of doesn't matter because there's a huge feel good factor. It's a addition to our quality of life. So we're very, very happy with the system. Got to say though, it's not really going to be 46 years to pay back because I didn't service our oil boiler for five years. So we've saved 400, 500 pounds uh, for those five years of servicing that we haven't done. I took the decision that if it was going to break, it was going to break and I'll just change the system sooner if it did. And lo and behold, it hasn't broke at all. So we've saved that money. So that brings it down to 42 years. So I'm sure if I was being really economical and if I was being really uh, clever with all these numbers, I could make it cost justify if I wanted to. But I didn't want to present that um, because we're a very, very low usage case. I think changing your heating system away from oil and gas is just something you ought to be doing anyway. Yes, it costs more to do it up front, but there are benefits. And that's what I wanted to cover today, what the benefits are. Yes, they're financial. So for us, it makes sense in retirement to spend money on infrastructure. So that money's gone and it's not in our savings accounts or pension funds anymore. And that means our electricity bills, our utility bills are really low going forward. Low bills going forward means we have more money to enjoy ourselves, going on holiday, going to the pub, having lunches out, just enjoying ourselves freely being able to drive where we want without worry about the cost of fuel. All of those things is that freedom, it's that peace of mind, it's that better way of living and knowing that you're doing the right thing for the environment. It's no emissions from it as well. So yeah, it's a really good thing to do. 
We're extremely happy with our heating system. I can't say that enough. I've said it quite a few times, haven't I? I hope you get why. Anyway, thank you so much for watching the video. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope there's some useful data there for you. If you're thinking about changing a heating system, now is the perfect time to start planning it while you don't need to do it. Get those quotes in, see what you want to do. Are you thinking of doing it? Are you going air source heat pump with a wet radiator system? Or are you going air to air heating like us? I certainly can't recommend it enough. For us, it works much better than a wet radiator system. Take care, see you again soon for more energy videos, electric car videos, battery videos, all those great things. Take care. Bye for now. Just in case you wanted to look at the spreadsheet again, here's all the numbers. Look at the ones at the end. Eddie hot water for the entire seven months, £15.30. And to charge our two electric cars, £56.87. It's pretty cheap, isn't it, when you go electric?